All right, for the last six weeks, this would be number seven. We've been, actually it's been eight or seven weeks because I, I didn't speak one of those weeks. But six weeks we've been talking about kingdom renovations. And you might wonder what that title's about. It just means this, is that uh, there is a kingdom of God that needs to be established in this earth. But there is a kingdom of Satan that is already established, well established in this earth. And we need to tear his kingdom down, Satan's kingdom. And we need to be rebuilding God's kingdom in its place. So the title of the message today is Charge. Charge not as in charge on your charge card, charge on your charge account. Charge as in what they used to do in battle. They'd say charge and they would move forward swiftly against their enemies. So we've learned over the past few weeks that there are two invisible kingdoms which are constantly at work and behind everything that occurs in the natural world. You may not see them, but they are there and very powerful. There is the kingdom of darkness that is led by Satan himself, and its objective is to destroy God's most precious creation, which is man. Man. Then there is the kingdom of light, which is led by the king of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. And it is his mission to save all who are lost and to destroy the works of the devil and to build in that kingdom's place, the kingdom of darkness, to build in its place the kingdom of light. In the Lord's Prayer, the Lord says plainly, I want you to pray this way. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come. Let your kingdom, Lord, be established on this earth just as it is in heaven. And how is it in heaven? It is such that in heaven that Jesus Christ is on the throne. He rules everything. And thing is under the control of God's spirit, which on this earth, that's not so much the case. There's lots of things that are under the control of the enemy. There's lots of things. Uh, you can just look around yourself and see all the evil that prevails. There's lots of things that the enemy still is controlling. And God says, I want to establish on this earth a, a different rulership, a different kingdom. And it starts in our own lives. You know, you may not be able to go out there and save everybody in the world, but you can certainly work on yourself. You can certainly work on tearing down the kingdom of darkness in your own life and establishing the kingdom of light. And those who have done that, who have torn down the kingdom of darkness in their own life and established the kingdom of light, they have become effective to help others to do the same. It's not much of a witness. <clears throat> it's not much of a testimony if we're telling everybody else how they can be free and we're bound ourselves. If we're telling everybody else about how they can live holy and we're living an unholy life, it's not much of a witness, is it? If you are in Christ... That is, if you have repented of your sins and accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then you are, you know what you are? You're a soldier in the kingdom of light. Like it or not. You say, I want to be a conscientious uh, objector. Can't do it. You are a soldier in the kingdom of light. Like it or not, that's what you are. If you have not, however, accepted Jesus Christ, then you are a slave in the kingdom of darkness. There's no choice. If you haven't accepted Jesus, you're a slave. You can say, but I don't want to be a slave. It doesn't really matter. You don't want to be a slave. You need to go to the Savior who sets free. There's something very important in what I just stated. If you are a child of God, you are a soldier, not a slave. You have been called to fight. That's what soldiers do. You haven't been called to sit it out on the bench. You've been called to fight because that's what soldiers do. You've been given weapons. Why would he give you a weapon if you're a conscientious dick, uh, or, uh, objector? If you're a person that isn't going to fight, he gave you weapons to fight with. He gave you armor. Why do you need armor unless there's an enemy fighting against you? He gave you power and authority. What do you need to exercise all that power and authority uh, for if everything's running as it should? You have an enemy. Your enemy, however, now this is something a lot of Christians need to get straight. Your enemy is not the children of darkness. It's not the lost. That's not your enemy. The lost aren't your enemy. Your enemy is not those who have not accepted Jesus Christ. Your enemy is the devil. One of your main objectives is not to fight against the children of darkness. They're not soldiers. They're slaves. They're prisoners. Your objective is to set them free and to bring them into the kingdom of light. See, Jesus came to save the lost. He didn't come to save the saved. He didn't come to those that were saved. He came to those that weren't saved. He came to the slaves to set them free. That's what we need to be doing as well. You say, well, but they're doing evil. They are assaulting God's children. That is true, but 
they don't realize what they're doing because they're slaves, because they're blind. So often we, we think so much about what people do. It's like they are the source of evil. They're the, it's their evil mind putting all this together. Some of these people are just simply deceived. Some of these people are duped. Some of these people are slaves to their master and don't realize what they're doing. That doesn't excuse them for their actions. But it makes us to maybe put our, our aim and our goal of, of, of fighting against the devil rather than against the people. Those people are pawns. They're slaves. They're under the control of their slave master. But they're not the enemy. Now, I want you to look at Luke 23, 33 through 39. This is when Jesus is being crucified. He makes a statement that's kind of, kind of odd. Here's what it says in 33. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right hand and one on his left. Jesus said, and listen to what he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Now, wait a minute. Forgive them, let them off the hook, not hold them responsible. They don't know what they're doing. What's he talking about? They know what they were doing. They were killing an innocent man. Jesus was obviously innocent, but he said they don't know what they're doing. Jesus did not call down fire from heaven and destroy them, but he could have, couldn't he? He could have destroyed them all. Jesus was not battling against men, neither are we. He was battling against the devil. That is the enemy that he defeated. Not evil men who walk in darkness, but the devil himself. That's who he defeated on the cross. Jesus had the power to fight against his captors, but he chose not to do it. He he didn't have to let them nail him to the cross, but he didn't fight, did he? Matthew 26, 53, you don't have to turn there. It says this, Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Oh, he could have called in the the Marines, and gotten off that cross. But it was his desire to fulfill the Father's will. So look back again uh, where we were reading in Luke chapter 23, where it says, forgive them, they know not, know not what they're doing. And 35th verse says, the people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. Now it says, the rulers sneered at him. They mocked him. But he said, he did say in the end, he says, they don't know what they're doing, didn't he? He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. All right, then 36 says, the soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine and vinegar and said, if you're the king of Jews, save yourself. The Roman soldiers mocked him. And they beat him also. But he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. 38th verse Uh, there was written a notice above him which read like this, uh, King of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there uh, hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. The criminals next to him insulted him, mocked him. But he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Would you and I say that people who treated us like that, people that beat, beat us, nailed us to a cross, mocked us, would we say they don't know what they're doing? I think we'd say, you know exactly what you're doing. I think we would have prayed, Father, get them, wouldn't we? They know exactly what they're doing. It wasn't just because Jesus was being nice. Even if Jesus was just being nice and merciful, he's not going to lie. He's not going to say they don't know what they're doing if they really do. Would he lie? I guess they didn't know what they were doing. How can that be? Jesus assigned the blame exactly where he knew it belonged, on the devil. The crucifixion was the devil's plan. It was his idea. It was his goal. The men involved were simply blind slaves following their master. Jesus did not come to destroy evil men. But he came to destroy the author of evil itself, the devil. First John, we've gone over this for the last few weeks. First John 3, 8 says this. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. That's what it says. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. The devil's the target. Was Jesus successful in his mission? 
I'd like to turn to Colossians 2, 13 through 15. Did Jesus destroy the works of the devil? Did he break the hold of the devil off of men? Did he triumph on the cross? Here's what it says in Colossians 2, 13 through 15. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. He forgave us while we were in our sins. Having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. Listen to this. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The public spectacle was a public spectacle in the spiritual realm. He triumphed over the devil, and in the spiritual realm, all of heaven... All the angels, all the demons saw that Christ was triumphant. As long as we are armed with powerful weapons, it would be best if we understood who we should be targeting with those weapons. And it's not men. It's the devil. Jesus came to set the captives free, and we need to have the same goal. We aren't sent to kill the devil's prisoners. We're sent to set them free. Jesus understood who his enemy was. Uh, we must know who the real enemy is before we can overcome him. So what action should we take against the evil works of the children of darkness? What should you do against the people who are working evil? Well, here's what Jesus says to do about those evil people that are working evil against you. Luke six twenty seven through 28. But to you who are listening, if you're listening, if your ears are open, if you'll receive the word of God, I say, love your enemies. Oh, man, that doesn't sound right, does it? Do good to those who hate you. Hey, at least can I just do nothing? You mean i got to actually step out of the box and do good? To those that hate me? Come on. Bless those who curse you. That's asking too much. Pray for those who mistreat you. I pray that they die. No, that's not what it says. It says to love them. It says to forgive them. It says to bless them. Blessing those that curse me? Oh, there's something wrong there. Well, you got to get this. You're a soldier. And it's not an easy job being a soldier. You're going to be asked to do things as a soldier that aren't that fun. You know? You've got to bear up and do it. Well, God says, you know what? If somebody offends you, you need to go to them. You need to get it straightened out. If somebody curses you, you need to bless them. If somebody beats you, you need to turn the other cheek. Oh, man, that's tough stuff. Well, soldiers have a tough job, don't they? But that's what Jesus expects. Stephen understood who his enemy was, just like Jesus did. When evil men heard the truth from this godly man, the response was not, oh, thank you for sharing the truth. Their response was, let's kill him. That's what they did to Stephen. As he threw stones at him, here's what he had to say. It wasn't, Lord, save me. It wasn't even about himself. But it was something that was totally unselfish and contrary to natural man. Here's what he said, Acts seven sixteen. Then he fell on his knees and cried out as they're throwing stones at him, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And he fell asleep. Like, don't, hold, don't blame them for this. And he said further, they don't know what they're doing. They just don't know what they're doing. We learned last week that the troops must be acting as one. We, as the soldiers in the kingdom of God, must be acting as one. We must follow the commands of the leader, not our own plan. Anyone or anything that causes division among the troops is an instrument of the enemy. Do you know, if you cause division in the church, you know you're being used by the devil. But I'm a Christian. Oh, the devil doesn't mind using Christians. It's okay with him. If you'll be used, he'll he'll use you. If you're a volunteer, he'll use you. Our general's first command is not straighten out your brother, is it? It's this, John 13, 34. A new command I give you. It's a command. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. He didn't say so you might want to think about love. He says you must. Love one another. If you're fighting amongst yourselves, if you're at odds with your brethren, if you're backbiting, gossiping, holding offenses, harboring unforgiveness, then you're not fighting on Christ's side, but you're actually fighting on the devil's side. Realize that? Oh, I don't want to admit that. Well, the truth sometimes hurts, but the truth sets you free. Christ is not going to say about people who do such things, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, because that would be a lie. Because we're the children of light, and we do know what we're doing. We have been enlightened to the truth, haven't we? So when we do it, God says, I hold you accountable because you know exactly what you're doing. I told you to love one another. I'm going to tell you something that's, it's not weird to me, but it might be weird to you. 
and you get used to it. Last week, I, I spoke quite a lengthy part of the message was about being thin-skinned and taking offense, and that the devil uses that to divide people. And here's what happens. I get lots of people telling me throughout that last week, just this is normal, calling me, talking to me, meeting with me, about all kinds of offenses that just occurred that week. Well, what do you think's going on? See, uh, when Jesus prayed for this boy who was a lunatic and fell into the fire, it says right before the, the devil left him, it says he tore him. And he, he made a loud noise. Well, you know what? When you want to get rid of that kind of attitude of offenses, of holding grudges, of, of not forgiving your brother, of division, when you say, I want to be done with that, well, the devil tries to last punch you. Say, well, let me see if they'll handle this offense. And suddenly there's all kinds of fights in the church. That's just normal. You have to get used to that and say, no, I'm not falling for it. It's a trick of the enemy. He wants us to walk in unforgiveness. That's what the enemy wants to do. But Christ wants us to walk in forgiveness. The enemy wants us to be divided because if we're together, we're very, very powerful and very dangerous to him. He wants us to be divided. He wants everybody to have their own goals, their own little thing, their own special spot with God that they share with no one else. You know? And that isn't what Jesus wants. Jesus wants us to be one. We're the children of light. We're free to make choices. We know the truth. We're responsible for our choices. Because indeed, we know what we're supposed to be doing. He told us in his word. We've got it, don't we? If you're easily hurt by your brethren, then that tells us something. Tells us you mustn't be wearing your armor. Thin-skinned people are always taking offense and personalizing it. Every little thing. Oh, that hurt my feelings. I'm upset about that. That just shows immaturity. We have to be strong. We have to be soldiers. As good soldiers endure hardship, the Bible says. Soldiers are well armored. And offenses can't penetrate into their heart. But they just roll off of them like water off a duck's back. If you're offended, you must, you know what you got to do? You have a responsibility to get it straightened out. You have to go to the person you're offended with. You need to reconcile with them, not go to them and just tell them why you hate them. But go to them and say, let's reason together. You see, the Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers, doesn't it? Now, a lot of people don't know what that means. They think that means blessed are the peacekeepers. That is not what that means. You see, peacekeepers often are the people that just say, I won't say anything because I don't want to ruffle their feathers. A peacemaker says, I'm going to go and straighten it out. I'm going to make peace. You make peace by talking about it. The devil doesn't like that. He wants you just to hold the offense on the inside. Anyone or anything that causes division amongst the troops, is an instrument of the enemy. Our general's first command is to love one another. So if you're offended, you've got to get it straightened out. You've got to reconcile with your brother. And if not, you're allowing Satan to cause division within the ranks. So we as free men and women need to put on our armor. We need to get our understanding of who the enemy actually is and what our objective is. We must begin to fight not for our own objectives, for that, but for those of the leader. Jesus Christ. We must throw off all the things that weigh us down and that encumber us from fighting. Hebrews 12, 1 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for, before us. You've got to throw off the things. And one of the things that holds you back, holds me back, holds anybody back, is not walking in love, walking in unforgiveness, harboring offenses. We must go into the battle armed to the teeth and clothed in the impenetrable armor of the Spirit. We're going to look at some of that armor right now. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. Finally, be strong in the Lord and, his, and in His mighty power. Isn't that an interesting thing? My strength comes from the Lord, doesn't yours? My strength comes from the Lord. So I can't depend on my own strength. I have to depend on his. But he tells me to be strong. Well, you know what? He tells you to be strong because he supplies you with the strength so that you're able to do it. So that there nobody is, has the excuse, I'm not strong enough. He says, no, I've given you the strength. Now you need to utilize it. Now you need to tap into it. You have the strength. You can't say, I'm not strong enough. He says, I've given you the strength. So he says, be strong. And in his mighty power, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil. Well, I don't want to fight. You don't have any choice. The devil's going to fight. You need to be ready. 
For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. You see that? It's not against people. It's not even against the sinners, let alone against the saints. Not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Hey, it's against spirits, isn't it? That's why you're wearing spiritual armor, not natural armor. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. You see, it doesn't say you can try to stand your ground in this armor and then if you fall, you know, well, hey, you know, that's, that's the way it goes. It says, no, if you stand, you will end up standing because you have enough strength and enough power with what God has given you to do the job. You can resist the devil and he will flee from you. With an attitude of boldness and with God on our side, who can stand against us? Huh? Romans 31, or 8, 31 through 32 says this. <clears throat> What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Everything you need, he will give and supply. Now it's time to attack the enemy's stronghold. It's time to destroy the walls of his city, destroy the weapons of his warfare, to take all his soldiers, prisoners, and those are spirits, by the way, not people, to set the captives free, and those are people. And this, of course, means spreading the light of God's word because they're walking in darkness, and what do you suppose destroys darkness? It's light. Light destroys darkness, doesn't it? Kingdom of darkness is our target. We can't be wimps. We're soldiers. We're fighting, and fighting's not always easy. But we always win if we fight. And the spoils of this war are extremely rewarding. The kingdom of darkness is our target. Light is our weapon. The sword is the spirit, the word of God. So where do we go now? How do we mount our first assault? Where do we assemble for the great battle? Well, as I said in the beginning, our enemy's kingdom is an invisible one. It's a spiritual kingdom. It exists in the dimension of the spirit. We need to meet together before the enemy's fortress by all coming to the same place and fighting side by side. We must all enter the realm of the spirit so we can fight this spiritual battle with spiritual weapons. (coughs) 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 says this. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. We do war, it's just not according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, we've got weapons, are not of the flesh. They're not natural weapons, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. That's what we've come to destroy. Kingdom of darkness. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing that raised up itself against the knowledge of God. And we're taking every thought into captive obedience to Christ. We cannot enter this battlefield by way of our flesh, but by way of our spirit. Our spirit can enter in. We cannot fight this enemy with natural weapons, but with spiritual weapons. To enter into this spiritual battlefield, you're going to have to leave your flesh and blood behind. This battle is one that is waged in the heavenlies, not on earthly soil. And guess what? Prayer is how you get there. Prayer is how you get there. Oh, but prayer is hard. You know what? Soldiers have to do hard things. But that's how you win the battle. Prayer. Prayer is the first line of attack against our enemy. Prayer is the thing that Satan fears the most. Soldiers in the army of God fight daily in prayer. It is in prayer that we're able to use the word of God to speak over our lives and the lives of others. The light of the truth that breaks all the chains of darkness. It is in prayer that we both communicate and receive communications from our commander. It's in prayer that we learn about how to best thwart our enemy because the Lord communicates with us. It's in prayer that we use the mighty name of Jesus and the word of God to completely disarm, disable, and defeat our enemy and to force him to flee from us. Fight the good fight of faith. How are you going to fight the good fight of faith? must be in the realm of the spirit, not in the realm of the natural. Faith is a spiritual substance. It's not a natural substance. There is no option of staying home from this battle because you're in it. Whether you like it or not, you're in the battle. It's not that you can decide to show up for the battle. You're in the middle of the battle. Every day you're in the middle of the battle. Every day Satan is fighting to take more control of your life. The question is, will you just lay on the ground and let the enemy run over you Or will you put on your armor, pick up your sword, and resist him and fight him in the spirit? 
prayer is not an option in the battlefield, it's a necessity. People wonder why they have heard so much about the liberty that the Christian should have. You know, there's so many things in life where somebody gives you this, uh, you know, a, a brochure, a flyer about this fantastic product and all this stuff it's going to do for you and you get all hyped up about it. And, you know, I'm going to buy that. It's going to change my life if I take this miracle, you know, a supplement. I'm just going to be a brand new person. I'm going to have energy and all this stuff. And you start doing this and after a while it's like, it just doesn't sound like the brochure now. It doesn't seem like I'm getting what they said. A lot of people talk about the Christian life. The minute you get saved, everything goes well. It's wonderful. It's a fantastic life. Everybody's happy that's in church. Everybody's happy in church, right? You know that's true, don't you? Everybody's free and happy. That's what, you know, no, no, no. Well, once you enter into church, once you enter into the spiritual life, guess what? You're a soldier and you're going to be battling until the day you die. Oh, is that bad news? No, it's not bad news because you've got superior weaponry. You've got the best armor and you can win the battle. But it's true. We're in a battle. So people wonder why they've heard so much about the liberty that Christians have, and yet they themselves are bound if they're a Christian. They've heard about the abundant life that the Christian should have, yet they live in spiritual poverty. They've learned about the victorious life that a Christian should have, yet they live in defeat. They've learned about the joy that Christians should have, yet they live in misery and depression. They've learned about the peace that Christians should have, yet they live in torment and fear. What's wrong with this picture? This is a picture of people who are not fighting for what's rightfully theirs. It's promised to you, but you have to fight for it. The kingdom of heaven is promised to every believer, but it's not delivered to your doorstep. You have to go out and get it. You have to go and get it. What is the kingdom of heaven like? Well, Romans 14, 17 says it's like this. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Everything that is good exists in God's kingdom. Healing exists in God's kingdom. Provision, deliverance, protection, peace, joy, satisfaction. It all sounds good, but how come so many Christians don't experience those things? A scripture we've looked at a few times over the last few weeks, Matthew eleven twelve, 12, says this. From the days of John the Baptist till now, the kingdom of heaven, that's the good thing, isn't it? Kingdom of heaven. That's not the kingdom of darkness has been forcefully advancing, and forceful men lay hold of it. So you mean the people just sitting there with their hands open don't lay hold of it? No, it's the forceful men. It's those that are fighting the good fight of faith. They lay hold of it. The battle takes place in the spirit. The battle is against the devil and against the kingdom of darkness. We're the ones who must wage the war to tear down the kingdom of darkness and lay hold to the kingdom of light. Our weapons are words. That is the word of God spoken in our prayers. That's where the power is. Prayers are the soldiers. Prayers are the victors. And all others will meet with defeat. We must know the word. We must believe the word. We must apply the word. We must have enduring faith in the power of the word. And if we do, we'll see the walls of darkness topple. We'll see the chains of darkness break and the kingdom of darkness retreat. Today, it's time to hear the battle cry of the commander, which is charge, move forward, move forward. Begin today to subject every thought in your mind to the word of God. It says that we bring captive every thought unto the obedience of Christ. There's so many thoughts we just let go. We let them run free. You know, we just let them run. We just tear the fences down and just let them run all over the place. Right? Sometimes we even invite some of these things into our lives by listening to the wrong things. Right? We read the wrong things, listen to the wrong things, and it brings in all these thoughts. These thoughts that do what? These thoughts that bring in darkness, these thoughts that cause us to, to lose faith, these thoughts that are uncontrolled. But it says that we cast down imaginations and every thought that exalts itself above the power of the Word of God. And we bring every thought into captivity, to obedience to Christ. That's a battle, isn't it? We battle with the word of God. We battle with the word of God. We begin to pray with holy boldness. And we pray like there is no tomorrow because you know what? There is no tomorrow for some people. It's not promised, is it? So if you knew today was your last day, do you think you'd pray at all? Think that would come to your mind? You don't think you'd maybe prepare yourself before the Lord? I think you would begin to pray. Well, today, we need to begin to pray and we need to say, We're going to be good soldiers, and we're going to start fighting the good fight of faith. And it starts with saying, I'm going to put on my armor and not be offended by my brother. I'm going to cause unity to be amongst 
the people that I'm around. I'm going to try to deliver the light of the word of God to the captives so they can be set free. I'm going to fight the good fight of faith in my own life. And I'm going to pray like there is no tomorrow. People that will do this together are an unstoppable force that will see the enemy's power broken off of their lives. And they will see God's power move across this land like a wave. If we would just get together, drop the offenses, stand against the enemy, and unite ourselves in prayer. I would like to ask the ushers to come forward.